everybody can you hear me? I, okay, I'm starting late, so I'm going to finish late, so please don't look at your schedule and think I'm going to be done in 10 minutes because it's a 20-minute presentation. <laughs> All right, um, so my name is Barbara Bahud. I am not an American. I'm from Mexico, but I do work in the United States. <laughs> so there we go. Um, the second thing I want to tell you is I wanted to start a question before your question because somebody was saying um, parents are complaining that physicians don't know enough. And that is absolutely true. And so that's why I created this project. So I'm going to tell you all about it. And does everybody have a pen? Can you lift your hands and show me your pens? And OK, great. Please use them. Write down notes for me. And email me when you're done with all your suggestions. You guys are the first ones to look at this data. I'm literally still analyzing it now. There's a lot of data I haven't finished analyzing. So if you guys are thinking of something that I didn't present, I want to know about it. So. I am so going to use this group. I'm so grateful I was invited. Thank you. So please send me all your suggestions. OK, so the reason why I came up with this project is I trained in a residency program in Brooklyn. And when I graduated from residency and I became a pediatrician, honestly, I didn't know that much about vaccines. And I wanted to work in vaccines. I always knew that. And then I became a vaccine safety fellow for the CDC in a program. And then I started learning about vaccines. I attended every single vaccine course that was out there, and I came here to ADVAC. And then I realized, does it really take a two-year CDC vaccine safety fellowship to learn everything you should have learned during residency? Because then I became a little bit more comfortable with the vaccines. And because I was comfortable, people started coming to me to get questions answered. And so then I went to my own uh, children's hospital where I got my first job, and I started training my residents on all the stuff that I had not learned. But then, you know, I would go to a lecture like this, and there's 100 residents in my program, and only 30 of them would be there, because one third are post-call, and one third are in clinics. So then uh, I had a very nice uh, four lecture curriculum, one per quarter, and I would only get about a third or a fourth in each class. So they didn't get the entire curriculum. So I felt like I was really still not training them the way that I wanted them to be trained. So then there was a call from Pfizer Independent Grants for Learning, which is the foundation arm of Pfizer, to train healthcare providers. And I jumped at that opportunity and decided to create a curriculum for residents. And the reason is because when I'm training the residents, I can see that they don't know what they're supposed to know. If I told you some stories of what they say, you guys would all just like drop right now. So we created COVER. It stands for the Collaboration for Vaccine Education and Research. And the reason why we created this, I, it originally was supposed to be Collaboration for Vaccine Education for residents. But I don't want it to be just for residents. This is just the beginning. I want it to be for everybody and anybody that needs to know about vaccines, nurses, medical students, healthcare providers, anyone. And it was created to develop, evaluate, and improve vaccine education for all healthcare providers. But the first project we're doing is with residents and we decided to focus on pediatric and family medicine programs. So our first objective was to establish cover, and these are the people that are collaborating with me. I'm the PI, and I'm working with Sharon Hummenstein. A lot of you probably know her. And Kadri Lewis is our education expert. Shannon Hummenstein is emergency medicine pediatrics. Donald Middleton is family medicine, and Elizabeth Williams is pediatrics, and I bring the ID piece. So we have a nice, comprehensive group of people that are collaborating. The second objective was to design and develop this comprehensive uh, curriculum. And so here's what happens. If you ask vaccinology people here, what does the vaccine curriculum look like? You're all going to be like 400 hours of vaccine education year round. And, you know, like we want to teach them everything there is to know. But program directors are going to tell you, get in line, because so does the endocrinology people and the pulmonology people and the cardiology people. So there's competing you know, educational needs for the residents. So what I did is I invited vaccine experts, program directors, education experts, and for those of you who don't know, residency programs have curriculums that you can purchase to train your residents, the Yale curriculum and the Hopkins curriculum. So I invited all those people to Kansas City once I got the grant, and before starting any work, I just wanted to get everybody in the same room and say, <laughs> what should this look like? So the vaccine experts were like, again, you know, 100 hours of training. The program directors were saying, my residents are passing the boards. They're getting jobs. They know what they know. They don't need to learn anymore. And then basically we got them together and we decided we were going to do what I was doing before. One one-hour lecture per quarter per year. 
So that way, the ideal curriculum would be one online module for the residents, and it would be online, flipped classroom technology, since whenever I did it face-to-face, -face, half of them wouldn't be there. But if you put it online, then they can access it whenever, wherever, and it's one per quarter that's required. So that seemed feasible. And I also invited, like I said, the Yale and the Hopkins curriculum people to make sure that I knew what was in their curriculum and that I wouldn't be reinventing the wheel. If they already have something that works, I don't want to recreate it or compete. I'm just trying to gather all the resources that are out there and make them all available under one roof. So then we decided uh, four modules, online flipped classroom technology. We evaluated a whole bunch of platforms and we chose Rise Articulate. I think it has to be geared towards millennials, so I wanted it to be easy to use and that you could just like tap with your finger. You can use it on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. And I didn't want it to be like the Hopkins and the Yale that was like a chapter. And if you sit down and you read that chapter, it takes you hours and it's kind of boring, even though it's good information, but you know, they're not gonna do it. It's the reality of it. I literally paid some residents to evaluate that content and I had to pay them to do it. And they told me it was good, but the truth is I would not, never read this if I had not been paid, so forget about it. And these are the four modules we decided on. Vaccine fundamentals, which is like vaccinology 101. Vaccine preventable diseases, which of course in one hour, it's not all vaccine preventable diseases. So that's why this is really just the curriculum for the first year. And the goal is, this is the pilot. In the future, I would have a curriculum for PGY1s, first year residents, second year residents, and third year residents, and it builds upon it. So the first year, which is this, would be the basics that everybody should know. <laughs> then the second year, maybe you choose, if you're gonna be a specialist, you do the module on special populations, <coughs> immunizations, for example, versus if you're gonna be a pediatrician, you do the module on how to store vaccines or something like that. So the idea is this is just the beginning and I wanna build a full curriculum for all three years of residency. And then we did a one uh, online, well, it's not online actually, it's face-to-face -face training guide focusing on flu and HPV because those are the hardest vaccines to usually convince parents and providers to administer. So we figured those two would be the target vaccines we would use. These are the modules. I'm gonna leave that slide till the end if we have time. I'll show you one of them so you can see what it looks like. The third objective went, was to implement and evaluate the curriculum basically. And so what we did is I recruited 26 family medicine and pediatric programs across the country. And in July of 2017, we administered a pre-survey. Then we randomized. And the way that we randomized was balancing based on whether you were family medicine or pediatric program. And that was a guess. Because we also could have done it by saying big program versus small program, rural versus urban. But we decided let's just guess that what's gonna make them different is actually whether you're family medicine or pediatrics. And I think we were right, and I'll show you that. After we randomized, we gave the programs that uh, got randomized to cover the curriculum, and the other programs just went on doing whatever they were doing. The ones that got the curriculum, though, this was research. That was my first mistake. I should have just done it education. So because it was research, it was optional. So it was optional for them to do the survey, and it was optional for them to do the modules. So please remember that when I show you the results, because imagine a resident that is told, please do the survey and please do these modules. Will you pretty, pretty please? So this is intention to treat. And I still have pretty cool results. So I think when this becomes mandatory, it's gonna be much better. Because it will. It is mandatory in my institution now. So, all right. And then we had 14 sites randomized to cover, 12 to control. And then we did the post survey, literally just finished July of this year. And now we're analyzing the data. So the items that we asked were some knowledge, attitude, hesitancy, confidence, and demographics. Some of them adapted from the uh, PACV, but of course adapted because it's for parents and these are providers. So some of the questions don't quite apply. And the ones that did, I had to tweak to you know, make them apply to the provider. But it was the best thing I could find. And now that I'm here, if somebody had invited me three years ago, I would have known that there are some, uh, you know, questions that I could have asked providers. So in the next step, I will use correct measures. And all of you that know how to do this, please email me and collaborate with me because I welcome all the help that I can get. Now, this is just one example of uh, some of the questions just to show you 60% um, correct. So if some of you were not believing me when I said residents don't know everything they're supposed to know, this is just a question asking basically uh, 
complications from one of the vaccine preventable diseases. And this other one is a safety question on who do you not give a live vaccine to? And look at the answer rate, 25%. So they need to learn some stuff. So finally, we analyzed the results and I'm gonna try to show you very quickly where what we got. So out of 26 sites, we had a total of about 1,400 residents. Now, for the pre-survey, we had fairly good response. Remember, I did not budget for any incentives because to begin with, I thought I was gonna use only 10 sites and we ended up doing 26. So this is surveys that were answered by the goodness of their heart. So 50% residents answered for the pre and about 540 for the post. And those that answered pre and post are in the middle, we got only 268. So I'm gonna try to analyze the data to the best of my abilities, but it is kind of complicated since not everybody answered the pre and not everybody answered the post. And we had to exclude some, and you can see how many were cover and how many were control of the ones that answered. So some demographics, I'm gonna skip, but basically you have PGY ones, twos, threes. You can almost ignore the fours when you see them in the graphs because they're very few. And we have, as you can see, pediatric family medicine, med peds, very few, and others. But the big component is PGY123 and pediatrics and family medicine. So in terms of knowledge, what we found here is that we did increase knowledge, both control and cover. So good news, they are learning something in residency without cover. So that's great. If we didn't see an increase in knowledge in controls, that would be very scary. But cover did increase it slightly more. Now, it's not really what I was expecting to find because everybody here has said it before, knowledge is not necessarily what we're looking to change. But I do believe that our residents don't have enough knowledge in vaccines. And when they have it, they may not be able to repeat it to you, but it does give them some confidence that makes them more capable of answering questions to the parents. Then, as you can see again, this is the intent to treat. So there is a higher increase in cover, but this is again, just some of the residents completing some of the modules. Some residents didn't do any, some residents did all of them, but the vast majority of residents did partial number of modules. Then if you look at knowledge by program type, you will see that um, if, you if you compare pediatrics versus family medicine, Pediatrics had higher knowledge compared to family medicine. So we kind of suspected that, but this truly confirmed it. And I think this opens up windows for interventions among family medicine programs, because we know there's a lot of discrepancies in vaccination covered in the United States, at least in rural versus urban areas. And you can see here that family medicine overall started at 47 to 51 versus pediatric sites started at 56, 54. And after the intervention, however, you can see that the family medicine control didn't move that much, 51 to 52. So that is kind of scary. But the control who started lower increased more. And uh, you can see in the pediatric side also, there was some increase, but it was much more pronounced in the family medicine program. And again, knowledge is not necessarily what I was super excited about, but it's still good to see that we had an impact in the family medicine practitioners. Now, vaccine hesitancy, I'm, I'm, I've been struggling and I'm still struggling even now with what do we define as vaccine hesitance? Just the last presentation, you decided 51 and above, 50 below, but is that really hesitancy? I don't know, you know, I kept thinking, what if you did the middle, the extremes are the extremes? Like, it depends on what you call it, right? So I have this um, syringe that we've drawn to try to explain that hesitancy is everything inside of the needle and the ones that refuse all are outside. So I think anybody that is kind of in between the refuse, maybe accept, but unsure that would be hesitancy. So this is how we called it, but I know that there might be disagreements. We asked this question overall, how hesitant about childhood vaccines would you consider yourself to be? If you're a physician, I think a different definition of hesitancy should apply to you than if you're a parent. Because if you're a physician, you're supposed to be the one recommending vaccines, you should have no concerns about vaccines if you know everything there is to know about vaccines. So at first I actually thought I should only do not sure, somewhat hesitant and very hesitant, but then I decided if they are physicians, they should not be answering I'm not too hesitant. Because if I told you your pediatrician is not too hesitant about vaccines, would you be happy with that? I wouldn't, I would be changing pediatricians. So I decided to call it that way, but I'm gonna show you both percentages. So the not too hesitant, fortunately was the vast majority, 86. But if you count everybody that I called hesitant, then we have about 13%, which is similar to what you found in the Kaiser Permanente data. So once again, 
The problem is Kaiser Permanente Data's parents. These are young healthcare providers. By, I am gonna argue that they come from the general population. So of course we're gonna find them, there they are. Now, if you wanna be more of a purist and tell me that residents who say they're not too hesitant are not hesitant, fine, then you have 2%. But I still think it doesn't make me comfortable at all to hear a physician who's gonna be out there in the battlefield, like somebody was calling it yesterday, answering vaccine questions, say I'm not too hesitant about vaccines. Now, here's a question, a sample question. Are, how sure are you that following the recommended CDC vaccine schedule is a good idea for your patients? I would hope all physicians would answer, uh, yay, amen, right? No. So if you monitor here our confident residents based on my definition, of course they agree that the CDC is a good idea, but you can see the difference between the confident and the hesitant residents is showing up in these questions. Now, how about children get more vaccines that are good for them? Imagine that you have um, Paul Offit in the middle, a picture of Paul Offit in the middle and Jenny McCarthy on the sides. It's not like they're Jenny McCarthy and they're completely polarized, but they're definitely pulled, as you can see here, just a little bit more skewed towards one side and the other, as you can see over here, versus our confident residents that are all the way up here. So there's definitely a, a bit of hesitancy there that I hope we can tackle. Now, what about hesitancy among the residents who did both the pre and the post? That's really where the money is because I wanted to know if our curriculum did anything to change hesitancy, right? So there were 101 residents in the pre only. There were 44 residents that completed both the pre and the post. Of those, 54% were family medicine. So notice how most of our hesitant residents, number one, they have lower knowledge in family medicine. Number two, family medicine is where most of our hesitancy is. So there's a very big opportunity for intervention. Second, one third of them moved to the confident category in the post. So I hope this shows you that we did have some impact and we moved the needle a little bit by educating them. And 64% of the ones that moved were family medicine. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. We were very excited. And here's just a graphic representation of basically the pre-survey in blue and the post-survey in regards to their declaration of vaccine hesitancy and how all groups were lower. Now, when it comes to confidence, we ask them on a scale of one to 100, do you consider yourself a vaccine novice or an expert? So this is just the, the way they feel about themselves. And you can see here that the non-cover people and the cover people after the, the intervention are cover people, the people that got exposed to our curriculum had a much more significant increase in their confidence of how they, their knowledge on vaccines and their um, expertise. Now, if you look at it by program, again, we have even better results specifically for the family medicine people. You can see that they started lower, cover started at 41.93, and they ended up at 60% with a very significant increase of 18 points compared to the other programs. And then if you wanna look at it by pediatrics and family in medicine, the same scale, notice that the other thing that I feel that we did is that we just tightened all the people moved up, but also the residents tightened around the mean so that all of them became more homogeneous in their beliefs and in their expertise around vaccines as opposed to being scattered all over the place. The same thing is remember, we designed this curriculum as the first year curriculum, even though we gave it to everybody. So it had the most impact with the PGY1s and you can see there, they felt uh, that they had increased more after the cover intervention, 25.89, and it's uh, significant as well. And for confidence again, how confident do you feel in your ability to discuss vaccines with a parent who would like to delay or withhold one or more vaccines? And you can see again, post cover, by far had much better effect than the controls. And again, this was intention to treat. So I know that at least in my program where I could track them, only 80% of them touched the modules. And of those that touched them, on average, they completed two to three. So now imagine this year, actually I'm doing the full curriculum with them and it's required now. So I'm gonna be able to measure the difference, but now I don't have a control, but still pretty exciting, I think. Once again here, just showing you how with the cover inter intervention in blue, everything tightens and moves up compared to the control. And with confidence, how well prepared do you feel to answer parental concerns regarding vaccines? And again, we were talking about 
physicians being in the front lines answering these questions, and after cover, they felt much more comfortable than their control counterparts. And this is, again, just a visual way of showing that. Now, I wish I had measured immunization rates, but that is pretty difficult to do. I'm going to try to figure out how to do it for the next phase. What I want to do next is to do the full curriculum and evaluate it amongst more institutions and measure immunization rates, although I'm still not sure how I'm going to do that. But in the qualitative focus group data that we got, residents like the length, they like it as a resource, they think it's easy, they, they like the interaction, and this is the one that I like the most. This made my, not just my day, but my year. I struggled with a family that did not want to immunize their children, and after taking all the modules, I was able to talk them with my newfound knowledge and confidence, and the family is now fully immunized. This was a family practitioner that was a Truman Medical Center next door to us, a third year resident. So I was pretty happy about that. And again, they like them, and they are getting better scores on the board so after taking the cover curriculum, so clearly they are doing better. So in conclusion, uh, first just the simple data from the pre-survey, peds and family medicine residents have baseline knowledge that is suboptimal. They know a lot less than we hope they would. And so parents are right when they say we don't know enough, it's true. Uh, family medicine has lower knowledge than pediatrics. There is vaccine hesitancy among our healthcare providers higher in family medicine. And then when it comes to the cover impact project, knowledge improved with cover curriculum more among family medicine practitioners. Self-reported vaccine expertise increased with cover, especially among family medicine and PGY1s. And confidence discussing vaccine questions with parents and addressing vaccine delays at the parents' request increased also with cover. So our next steps is I am um, organizing a roundtable discussion in Kansas City in November where I've invited a whole bunch of people that are here to see the full one-hour presentation of the 20-minute condensed one because I'm hoping to get further funding to continue doing this. Because every time I've presented partial results of this in other places, people <coughs> want the curriculum for OBGYN, central medicine, you know, anybody. And I want to give this to people, but we need to continue updating it for it to be available. And I'm thinking about writing an R1, although I don't know if NIH is the right funding mechanism. If there's any other ideas about where else I can go, please let me know. And th I think there's opportunities for using this type of uh, technology for other things, not just residency. Healthcare providers in rural areas, regular health providers, medical students, nurses, you know, anything. And these are just the modules. I'm happy to show them during lunch or at the break, whoever wants to see them because I do want to leave a little bit of time for questions. I went over two minutes, but I'll just show you one real quick so you can see the, the platform very quickly and how pretty it looks. So basically, this is what um, it will look like. And you first have this page, and you can do it, use it on your phone as well. And you can either start the course right here, or you can click on one of those links underneath. And you can see it's, there's a lot of white space. There's a lot of interaction and pictures and a lot of clicking and things that are interactive so that they can be doing this and they can be using it, for example, in between seeing patients. You don't have to do the whole thing in one sitting. It's okay to do it partially. And um, you can have also some quizzes in there to test your knowledge and it'll tell you what the right or the wrong answer is, just showing you more or less the interactivity of this thing. So that's it, thank you very much. And please do um, come to me if you have any questions or suggestions, if we don't have enough time after this, but especially suggestions, thank you.